Crotch was really becoming a superstar in the UK. You know, he'd done what he'd done in the USA, came back, beat Luce and Butte, and then boxed Mikhail Kessler on pay-per-view at the O2. Won that in an epic fight. And then he was like big time, you know, he was, he was the man. He is a wanted man, he knows his reputation's on the line. Groves is terrific at the moment. George Groves, really not in the running for a shot at Carl Froch. He had a mandatory due with the IBF. The third and the fourth and whoever else wasn't available or was injured. And it gets to George Groves. And Carl had a bit of a bee in his bonnet because it wasn't necessarily George Groves, but it was like Carl battled so hard to get an opportunity. He felt like George Groves hadn't beaten anyone to get the opportunity to fight the great Carl Froch. And I remember going to him and saying, you know, just to let you know, I think it could be George Groves. I think that fight could say, you know, he's like, George Groves, you know, fight me. I said, well, it might, we may have to because it looks like it's going to go down to, to George Groves in the, in the order of merit. Next thing you get a letter from the IBF to say, George Groves is your mandatory challenger. Please start negotiations. And at that point, it's like, oh, you know, we didn't represent George at the time. We had kind of like a... I don't know, up and down relationship with him. We signed him previously. You know, he was in the midst of, I believe, changing trainers and, and leaving Adam Booth or, you know, and I just, I, I felt like it was a good fight. You know, I thought an all British fight between an established, really great in Carl Froch and, and a guy who's coming through the ranks. I didn't see George as a massive danger, in all honesty. And I'm not sure Carl Froch did either, but he wasn't up for the fight. And that was a problem because Carl Froch needed to be up for the fight and next thing the fight gets made and we go up to the press conference and that first press conference kind of changed everything. I felt it was too early for George Groves. Don't forget he boxed on the undercard of uh, Froch Kessler, put in a good performance but again it wasn't really beating the level of opposition that would tell you he could beat Carl Froch. We knew he had a lot of ability, we knew he could punch but I didn't mind the fight. I, I actually felt like it was a fight that you know, was was a fairly comfortable fight for Carl Froch. I thought he'd, he'd be in trouble early and he'd sort of, you know, wear him down, down the straight. And um, that's actually what ended up happening, albeit in controversial circumstances. I'm not sure George was on Carl's Christmas card list, even before the fight was ordered. But, you know, it's a rivalry. It's a British rivalry. George had always said, I can beat Carl Froch. And Carl probably took offence to that because, you know, in his mind... Like, you know, you've got to earn your shot at me. And now, before you know it, George Groves was mandatory. Carl made his intentions clear after the Kessler fight. He was interested in the trilogy or a rematch of Andre Ward. Were either of them fights close to being made? Not really. I mean, you know, I, I think as a team, we felt that the Andre Ward style was bad for Carl Froch. But Carl Froch would have wanted revenge against Andre Ward. I'm not sure he would have beaten him. Ward was almost unbeatable at that time, at 168 pounds. And we had a mandatory. So unless we could find a unification fight or a reason to not do the mandatory, and George weren't moving. You know, George, George wanted that shot. George believed it was his time. I'd like to welcome to say a few words the challenger from Hammersmith, St. George Groves. You know, I remember the press conference pretty well. Um, George had kind of split from Adam Booth. And historically, if George was in a fight with Adam Booth, there'd be a dozen coming up for the press conference as well. And I remember he booked, I don't know, he asked for four or five tickets on the train. And I was like, well, that doesn't sound like many. And next thing, he's just turned up and he walked into the press conference with a couple of his team, I think his lawyer, and that was it. And at the time, no one really knew that he'd split from Adam Booth, but it was a big shock that he wasn't there. And he came into that press conference with a massive chip on his shoulder. I'm gonna hit you with two right hands. Just to, just to let you know, whenever I want, I can hit you with a right hand. I don't know if that was strategy, I don't know if he was in a mood. Tactics, probably as well, but just came into that press conference like a whirlwind with absolutely no respect for Carl Froch. And Froch couldn't believe the audacity of George Groves, the way he came in, you know, 
put himself up in the head-to-head, -head, spoke with a little bit of, I mean, a lot of assurance, a little bit of arrogance as well. No regard for the achievements of Carl Froch, and it really wound Carl up. And George was like that, very stubborn. He was like, this is what I'm going to do, and, and went into that fight, obviously, with a much smaller team. Take care, man. You see there? If anyone's going to smell it, it'll be you, wouldn't it? Why are you getting loud now? Where are you going? What are you doing? Maybe he felt like he didn't want to get beat by a, a young Brit. You get that domestically. A lot of fighters, they never really want to fight a young domestic rival because they know how hard they've worked to get there. They don't want to give it away to a, a young fellow countrymen. But again, a lot of what Carl's, Carl's rise to the top was so difficult and the road was so bumpy and fierce that he felt like George hadn't walked that road and, and shouldn't be getting in the ring with him. And who can forget the ringside episode? You were sat in the middle and you could tell Carl was certainly wound up. Do you think he was in his head at that point? We were sitting in the green room. I remember Carl was messing around and we just went on the set and I was like, I was sitting in the middle and I was just melting. I was quite inexperienced at the time and I was just sitting there thinking, what is going on here? Calm down, Carl. Final message, George? I'll put this chump asleep. We'll see. Look at him. Look, look. And he's, I'm just sort of sitting in the middle going... And Froch couldn't believe it. Froch was like... Is he having a laugh? Like, what is he doing? But it did eat him up, you know, it ate him up. And, and it really, you know, if I said tactically or whatever it was, it was working because it was winding Carl Froch up. I don't think he um, deserved it, but I think it's going to make for a great fight and a great spectacle. And I'm looking forward to absolutely you don't look demolishing like this jump. You look like you're on the verge of tears. Adam Booth was psychologically a good game player in build-ups of fights, and George kind of learned from that haymaker trait. David was the same and Adam, you know, they're always playing games, if you like, and trying to mess with people a little bit in the build up to fights. It was part of their ammo and that was in George as well, you know, but he was playing this role and he was playing it so well. I mean, I remember the, that press conference. Again, Froch is just like, this bloke's an idiot. What an, like, but he, he would keep saying it, so he'd leave and go, is this bloke all right? Like, what, what is he, oh, dip me. So it's like, you're, you're leaving the presser, but you're still thinking about the exchanges, you're still thinking about what was said, and, and that can drain you, mm. in a way, and that can let you lose even confidence, or, or I don't know, but it was, like I said, it was working. If you've been in a Carl Frox changing room, you can cut the tension with a knife. He's walking around, he's fired up, his nostrils are flaring, you know, he's breathing heavily. And when he makes that walk from the changing room to the ring walk stage, you know, I remember when he fought Butte, he was hyperventilating walking to the ring. And I walked with him to the changing room, to the walk on stage. And he was so quiet. And I said to him, you know, I thought at that point it's when you need to say something to the fighter. So I said to him, right, come on, switch on now. And he said to me, it's cold in here, isn't it? And I was like, oh. And I remember sitting down in my chair when I got out of the ring. And I think I might have turned to my dad or someone and just said, I ain't sure about this. He just, he didn't seem himself. You know, he, he didn't seem up for it. He didn't seem fired up. You know, was he doubting himself? Was the mind games working? I don't know what it was, but I've never seen Carl Froch like that in a ring walk. There is every possibility we could see a loose performance here. If you're not psyched up before you get into the ring, it's almost impossible to psych yourself up in there. And that transferred into the first round. What was going through your head at that moment? The world just stopped. It was like tumbleweed, you know, it's like... He got frustrated, he was angry. Carl felt in that fight, all I have to do is land one on him and the fight's over. As soon as I hurt him, the fight's over. And he got frustrated earlier, squared his feet, boom, walked onto one straight down the pipe. He's not throwing the jab with confidence, Froch. He's struggling with the range and the ball. Oh, and he's been nailed. Right hand, George Groves, timing perfect. Froch on the floor for only the second time. And I was just remembering, you know, I can actually see it now. It was, it was there where I was sitting. And he just, you know, and it was a huge knockdown. You know, and Rob McCracken always talked to me about fighters being fit, being conditioned, and their ability and doing the weight right and their ability to take punishment and get up. And that, I will always remember, is a classic example of how a fighter that makes weight and a fighter that is well conditioned can get himself up off the floor. Because that was one of the heaviest knockdowns 
I've ever seen. And Rob McCracken is going to have to give one of the great talks in one minute, but what can he do to turn this around? Because Frotch looks all over the place in there. I always felt going into the fight that, you know, Carl might face some tricky times earlier in the fight. George is very sharp. We knew he could punch. But I just, I really strongly felt that George wouldn't be able to last the 12 rounds at the Carl Frotch pace. But Carl had to make sure it was the Carl Frotch pace. Even if he had to take punishment, he had to make George Groves work. He had to put pressure on him. He had to make him throw punches and wear him out. So for two, three foot, listen, he was getting pinged everywhere. But I was okay because I didn't feel like he was getting hurt. You know, you felt that there was a chance that George could unravel if this pace continued. And I think it was in the fifth or the sixth, Carl started taking a lot of punishment, but he started to land a few. And I was actually okay. I was thinking as long as Carl, I was hoping that George's power was going a little bit, that he was tiring, I think it was. But I started to think during those periods, you know what? He just got to keep going, keep going. And I think he'll wear him down. Yeah, it was round six where Carl went back to the corner um, and said, fuck me. Rob McCracken is a tremendous trainer, tremendous trainer. And one thing that Rob has is getting his fighters to believe in him. And that is so important when you're facing tough times in a fight and you go back to your corner. You know, I, got, I always remember the AJ Klitschko fight, same thing. AJ may not have come through that fight without Rob McCracken in rounds five and six. And that was the same with Carl Frotch. You know, you, you need that familiarity, you need that voice, you need that trust. As if, and I just felt like that was the moment that the fight can turn here. And it did, the fight started to turn. Frotch was winning rounds, George was unravelling, he was getting marked up, and I felt like the fight was turning. Frotch has to come up with something, and he knows it. The right hand, oh, good, he's just I oh, saw that one, but that one was in the chin. That was a beauty from Frotch, that was bang on the chin. People will talk about the stoppage forever, really. And again, I remember it. it. George's back was to me. I was five feet away from it. George started to look very tired. And it was really the punch that did it was when they traded and Carl landed a left hook. But George's chin was in the air and it probably looked worse than it was. I think Fraj needs to finish it here. It really does. Groves, Groves is, is in trouble. Thing. He's taken another one and another. And Howard Foster has stopped it. Wow, that is going to be controversial. It was George's body language. All I could see was his back, but I could see his body slumping. Now, a little bit like when Michael Conlon got beat by Lee Wood. But it was like his body language didn't look good. And Howard jumped in quite fast. And where I was, I was OK with it. I mean, obviously, I'm biased, but I felt like George Groves was done. It was only really when I got into the ring and I heard the boos ringing out, I was, I was quite surprised. Rob lifted Carl Frotch up and, you know, then I went over to the, the Sky reporters and, and commentators and everyone, oh, you yeah. know, and I'm like, oh, wow. And it was when I watched it back, I saw a very different story. You know, when I saw George's face and I saw that, you know, Howard was really the one that moved him backwards onto the ropes, I honestly feel that Carl Frotch was on the way to a clinical stoppage in that fight. But with how George performed, I do think the stoppage was early. The tide was turning. George Groves was winning the fight, without a doubt. But I have no doubt that Carl Frotch would have gone on and either won that fight on points or stopped him at any moment from when Howard Foster jumped in. It was really just you know, the controversy of the stoppage that led to one of the biggest fights in the history of the sport. A fight like that shouldn't have been stopped until the referee was sure. He couldn't have been sure. British fight fans love, you know, love a brave performance, and that was super brave from George Groves. And you know, he gained a lot of fans that night. And like you said, I remember Carl Froch was. He felt like the stoppage was fine. Obviously, the the crowd didn't. With what was said post fight, with what was said pre fight, we had a lot of work to do to make the rematch. I saw the reaction. And I felt like the rematch was huge. So I went and I went to various stadiums. We were very close to going to Emirates. And I went to Wembley and I walked through, probably just because I was like a young fan really, and walked through the players' tunnel and I thought, oh, this is Wembley. And looked around and I was like, we've got to do it here. 
And I remember phoning my dad from the players tunnel, saying, Dad, I'm at Wembley. Got to do Frotch Groves here. What do you think? And he went, how many are you setting up for? I was like, oh, they reckon they can get us 80,000. He went, are you mad? And he went, you can't do it there. He said, even if you do 40,000, which would be incredible, it'll be embarrassing. He said, a bit of advice for you. He said, when Eubank beat Watson in the first fight, there was a lot of controversy. A lot of people felt Michael Watson won. That was at Earl's Court. I did the rematch at Tottenham and it really didn't sell. Don't think this fight is bigger than what it is. And I said, I don't know, I think we can do it. We pulled the trigger and the rest is history.